Greetings and welcome to Mount Olympus. I am Hercules Invictus and today two streams converge. One, Hercules and the Space Gods in which I explore cosmic mysteries that are occurring today and living theurgy where we discuss ancient practices and ways of looking at and working with the world and the divine that are going on today. So today we blend those two streams and uh, see where they take us. Uh, we have our esteemed theurgist, Tony Roswicki, we have Apollonius, and we have Brandy Williams, and I'm really looking forward to this uh, conversation. Uh, so we'll start with Tony today. Tony, tell us about your explorations into the cosmic realms. Um, I've actually been doing a little bit of reading about light workers and star seeds and how they tie in with the practice of theurgy. So it dawned on me that one of the ways of practicing theurgy is through an ascension through the planetary spheres to the realm of the divine. So this is normally a practice for an individual. However, it can be done in a group setting so that participants can experience higher planes. The limitation is that only small numbers are involved. And it seems that an increasing number of new ages believe that all of humanity needs to ascend or transition from three-dimensional to five-dimensional space, which is also referred to as new earth or new age. And it's claimed that there are beings who have incarnated to facilitate this transition by raising the vibrational rate of the planet through a mission of love. Many of these beings are light workers who have incarnated from high dimensions. Light workers work upon themselves in order to become activist teachers, authors, and artists and sometimes as role models who live their lives with integrity and honesty. These light workers inspire, guide, and empower seekers. The largest subset within the light workers are the star seeds. So it's often said that while every star seed is a light worker, not every light worker is a star seed. So as the name implies, star seeds have their origins outside of the earth plane in distant stars or even parallel universes. Star seeds typically feel like outsiders and out of place until they have an awakening as to their true identity mission. The process actually reminds me of Gnostic texts where individuals undergo an awakening process and are reminded of their divine origins. And those who haven't undergone such a process are referred to as sleepers. There are a number of origin points for where star seeds apparently come from, but the two most prominent ones are from the Pleiades and Sirius. Other origin points include Andromeda, Lyra, Orion, Arcturus, and Alpha Centauri. The Pleiadian star seeds, as their name implies, have had a previous incarnation of the Pleiades, which is a star cluster containing over 800 stars, but only seven of which are visible to the naked eye. The Pleiades are commonly referred to as the Seven Sisters and lie within the zodiacal constellation Taurus. Pleiadian star seeds are highly intuitive, empathic and creative. The, Styrians, the Syrian star seeds, as their name implies, have had a previous incarnation around Sirius, which is known as the dog star and is prominent in the constellation Canis Major. Sirius is a binary star consisting of Sirius A and Sirius B, but there have there has been speculation that it could even be a triple system. Syrian star seeds have apparently visited our planet on numerous times in the past and tend to work in creative fields such as the arts and the writers, healers, and mystics. Their mission is to help humanity evolve through unconditional love. It should be noted that everything that is written about light workers and star seeds is channeled and will vary from source to source. So, um, we can tie all this in with ancient techniques and this is sort of where i wanted to take um my thoughts so the mythologies of numerous cultures have dealt with the stars and it's possible that these mythologies provide insights and possibly even portals to experiencing these stellar energies that star seeds are claiming to originate from in greek mythology the pleiades were seven mountain nymph daughters of the titan atlas and pleione the name pleiades means daughters of pleione and also ladies of plenty from the Greek word pleon, which means plenty. The leader of the Pleiades was the mother of Hermes by Zeus, Maya. Maya translates to mercy mother. And the other Pleiadian nymphs are Telgete, which means of Mount Telgetus, Electre, which translates to amber, 
Alkione, which means strong help or kingfisher, Kelino, which means black, Merope, which means face turned or bee eater. And the last one has two possible names, Sterope, which means flashing light, or Asterope, which means star faced. So the Pleiades eventually formed a constellation. One myth recounts that they all killed themselves out of grief over the death of their sisters, the Hyades. Another explains that after seven years of being pursued by Orion, a lustful beast and giant, they were turned into stars by Zeus. Orion became a constellation too and continued to pursue the sisters across the sky. So one way of working with the Pleiades is by using, using the Orphic hymn to the nymphs. Um, that's probably the way I would approach them. And for Sirius, Sirius was a key star for Egyptian astronomer priests who noted that it rose with the sun just prior to the annual flooding of the Nile. Sirius was called Sothis and was identified with the goddess Isis. Around 3000 BC, this occurred around June 25th, which is near the summer solstice, but now occurs around August due to the procession. Isis was a very popular goddess in late antiquity during which theurgy was extensively practiced and there are numerous hymns dedicated to her. One or more of these could be used to work with Sirius. So there are many, of course, many legends corresponding to the constellations, allowing for an understanding of the energy emanating from them. There are numerous hymns available for these constellations. And of course, there is the option of seekers making up their own hymns for the purpose of invocation. So it, it seems to me that um, we'd readily be able to tie in the practices of um, a lot of new ages with theurgy. Very good outline. <laughs> There's a lot there. It deserves several shows. And uh, uh, I have, I've had several specials on the star seeds, and uh, I'm thinking of making a show just on the star seeds. Uh, since Percy Jackson came out, the fictional series, a lot of uh, Hellenic or Olympian themed star seeds are calling themselves demigods now. So wow. uh, there are even some groups in uh, uh, Facebook and some of them were inspired by one of my old uh, websites. Uh, so I get uh, emails every now and then asking uh, questions. The Percy Jackson series was absolutely incredible in bringing a lot of young people to the um, legends of the Greek gods. So I, I see all of that sort of thing as being incredibly positive as it increases interest. I mean, sure, it's entertainment, but there will always be some people who will be looking at delving into the truth of the Greek myths. That, that's very true. And it's, it's mythology has always been conveyed through the popular culture uh, and you know, entertainment. Uh, and even in antiquity, you had Homer, he was a bard. Uh, and uh, you had, instead of action figures, you had plates and uh, other uh, pottery with uh, pictures from the stories, just like now we have scenes from movies on our uh, McDonald's and Burger King cups and so forth uh, when these mythical type of movies come out. Yeah, exactly. So um, as you pointed out, a, lo a lot of what we know comes from the writings of Homer, but a lot comes from Hesiod as well. And not all those myths um coincide there are various myths and as time went on still further myths came about so you, you can see everything morphing with time so hollywood's just taking things to the to the next level and, and that, that too has been something that's been going on since the dawn of time because again we do have several different versions and uh um, mythology is a very fluid uh, thing. I remember when Hercules, the legendary journeys and Xena warrior princess won, a lot of folks are complaining about some of their wilder shows like the Jack and the Beanstalk episode and the Archangel Michael episode. Uh, but I used to point out that actually uh, those are true to uh, studies in folklore. And the, there was one uh, scholarly paper comparing the Hercules legend to Jack and the Beanstalk. Uh, and also in the neo-theosophical or neo-gnostic uh, traditions, um, Hercules is in the same cosmic ray as the Archangel Michael. And, you know, there are all sorts of stories going on there. So uh, the, the things that appeared 
far from the mark. We're actually on the mark. Even Disney's Hercules, people complained about that. But if you look at Etruscan uh, uh, traditions rather than the Hellenic ones, um, Hera was Hercules's mother. They did not have a hostile relationship. And in the uh, Etruscan tradition, or in some of them, uh, Athena was Hercules's wife, and uh, uh, Mars or Martus or Ares uh, was their child. So you know, the, the, there was a lot of fluidity. Yeah, Thanks. a lot of research there. Yeah, and and as you pointed out, those episodes stimulated a lot of discussion, a lot of thought, which is always a good thing. I agree one hundred percent. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask uh, Tony before we move on to Apollonius? I have a question. Would you mind re returning to this in, in another show where we can discuss, we, we could devote a whole hour to your your explorations into the new age? Um, yeah, yeah, I suppose so. I was actually, um, I, I did a little bit of reading about star seeds and, and, and light workers and, um, and I was just struck by the, the overlaps between what they're saying and what they're claiming and the practices which we're doing there there does seem to be a, a lot of overlap so I, I think it's certainly an area worth exploring if you want to look to more ancient star trek type of uh, uh experiences the hecalot literature um in the merkaba literature uh, from the ancient Near east from the um the hebrew traditions yeah the chariot riders Yes, that is full of all sorts of Star Trek-y type of stuff from antiquity. Absolutely. So welcome, Tony, to the Starseed universe. <laughs> You're funny. And with Apollonius, we return to the ancient world and uh, Apollonius's work in a publication that just <laughs> came out. Yeah, well... Thank you. Uh, yeah, that was a fabulous uh, introduction um, to that whole uh, area. I don't know much about uh, the, the the Starseed universe or or the whole uh, idea of the light workers, but it does sound very familiar. As as Tony mentioned, it has a lot of similarities with uh, Gnosticism, especially uh, rituals of ascent. Um, also, the Hermetic uh, literature with its rituals of ascent and uh, Merkaba, as you mentioned, um, and and of course ne the Neoplatonic, which is what I'm most familiar with. So I think you know what we can see here is a whole system. Of course, they borrowed from each other, especially these ones in the West. They were all borrowing from each other and learning from each other, just as we do now. I, I kind of think of Alexandria and really the whole Mediterranean world, you know, in the centuries. Uh, BCE and and the uh, first maybe six centuries CE of just uh, you just this this ferment of people borrowing ideas and especially techniques theurgical techniques from each other and um, you know I think what we know you know the in the Chaldean oracles it says the the the, the goddess says we put on these forms for you you know basically we appear in forms that we think are appropriate for you which means culturally appropriate and also appropriate for a particular belief system so a being might appear as a goddess to a, a, a pagan and as an angel uh, to a, 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 a jewish or christian practitioner or or maybe an islamic practitioner too uh, and and so on so i think that um you know we have there's the surface stuff you know the names of the particular beings um how they appear how we conceive of them all of these things uh vary from person to person and um a lot of that is our just our personal filtering of it um so you know um i think it's and, and of course now we've got modern versions you know uh, jung pointed this out a long time ago he said you know uh in fact it's where the idea of chariots of the gods comes from is you know that we used to conceive of these beings coming, riding through the sky in chariots drawn by flying horses and things like that. Now we think of them as coming in flying saucers or in some other sort of technological um, vehicle. Um, 
and uh, well, or transporter or whatever it may be that 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 seems to fit better our our uh, understanding of the universe. So I think you know the 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 ancient and modern parallels are really interesting and and absolutely crucial. Among other things, it keeps us from taking the the details too seriously, of being too literalistic. Oh, you know. Michael is dressed in this kind of robe. Oh, no, he's not. He's dressed in that kind of robe. And he carries a sword in his right hand. Oh, no, he, he carries a torch. Whatever, you know, um, we can become very literalistic about these things because to the person doing the theurgy, it's very real. And, um, and so all of the details, all of the richness of it seems very real. And it is real to them, but I, I think we have to realize that the reality beyond it is something different that we really can't visualize. That's why the, these beings have to appear to us in these forms. And, uh, and therefore that makes us a little more um, humble really, but, but uh, not so attached to the particular forms in which the, the beings come to us and a little more tolerant of the forms that may come to, come to other people. And, uh, I think that that, you know, is the only danger of um, many of these uh, different channeled um, um, ascents, especially, or um, apocalypses, literally revelations, right, uh, is that um, people tend to think that theirs is the only right one, and therefore everyone else is wrong, and, and either misguided or, or some sort of heretic. Uh, or they're not talking to the right gods. You know, they're talking to some sort of of evil gods or something like that. And I mean, you can see this, you know, in 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 certainly in, in the Gnostic literature, which I've been looking at a bit lately. You know that they've all got their sort of competing systems, and it's like, well, yeah, you can see what they did. You know, they did a theurgical ritual. They went, they ascended through all of the various spheres, which typically include the planetary spheres. But you know other spheres which are peculiar to each uh, system, and that was the experience they had. That was the experience probably they needed to have for whatever was going on in their life, um, and um, perhaps to to also convey that experience to others. Um, uh, but perhaps not. Perhaps it was just for them, you know. And um, I think. Um, you know, that then you can see these things in later centuries turning into heresies because everyone's got their sacred book uh, and they uh, interpret it literally and they say, if my book's right, then yours must be wrong. So um, I think that that's, that's an important thing to keep in mind. And one thing that, you know, looking at these more modern versions um, seriously, you know, and understanding that people are having these experiences and that these are genuine experiences, and that they're telling us something, I think um, helps us to avoid um, becoming too literal about it and also too dogmatic about it, really, too. You know, well, either eight spheres or nine spheres, you know, I'm, let's start a, a war over it, you know. Um, so that's, I mean, that's that's sort of one impression. I, you know, um, I can talk a little bit if you want about um, Plethon's. Uh, idea of this, yes, but, you know, that that's, um, it does illustrate it in some ways, because what Plethon, this is George Chemistos, who called himself Plethon, uh, the um, uh, early Renaissance uh, Platonic philosopher, pagan Platonic philosopher, uh, that he um, basically has a theology, which is based in Platonism, where basically uh, he describes all of the various uh, gods. And um, he says, you know, he said, well, you know, let's just call them by the Greek names because that was the names our ancestors used. Of course, he was a Byzantine Greek. And so he was just saying, you know, these are the names we've, we've used. You know, yes, they've been corrupted by the poets. He's thinking of Homer and Hesiod. And the, and the ancient Greek dramatists, you know, they tell all of these terrible stories about the gods, um, you know, which, yeah, you can interpret them symbolically, but basically he's saying, you know, they, they, they're just, um, they may have been inspired, but they're also can be misleading. 
But he says, nevertheless, we can still use those names that have been handed down by our ancestors because they're familiar and, you know, they do fit. Um, but when you read uh, Plethon's works, um, you know, it's clear that the way he attached the names to particular gods is somewhat arbitrary. And this bothers people because they'll say, well, that's not Bacchus the way I understood Bacchus, you know, or it's not Bacchus is the way or Dionysus as the way he's described in, in uh, Euripides or in Homer or, or, or somewhere else. Uh, well, that's true, you know, um, but what he's done is he's identified a particular deity, which he can describe in terms of what its function is, what its attributes are, and then he's attached the name Dionysus to it, to that deity. And, um, you know, so you could argue with whether that was a good choice or not. I mean, he was a highly educated philosopher and historian. So I think his choices, you know, we should think twice before we question them because there's a lot of learning and insight that goes into them. Uh, but nevertheless, ultimately, he's just saying, these are just names. These are the deities. These are the names I'm putting, putting onto them. Um, um, now, where did he get this stuff? Well, I said it's mostly philosophy that he's getting from preceding uh, Platonic and Neoplatonic philosophers uh, in the in the centuries uh, before him, who he was very very familiar with and had read very carefully and thought about very carefully. Um, uh, did he do theurgy? Not clear. You know, um, there's some hints of it in some of his writings. Um, but um, uh, he certainly doesn't talk about it much if he did any theurgy. So it seems like he was more interested in, interested in sort of a philosophical analysis than a theurgical approach. He may have felt there was too much theurgy that had been done already. And that's why you have Proclus with his very complicated system of gods. And, and again, the whole hierarchies of beings, very complicated doesn't agree with Iamblichus, doesn't agree with Porphyry, doesn't agree with Plotinus. They're all kind of, you know, you can see they're sort of different versions of the same thing, but they disagree in lots of details. And again, I would come back to what I said at the beginning. You know, they these people had different experiences. And um, because they were trying to interpret some of this literally, then they had to try and fit these systems together, you know, and so there was sort of a shoehorning. Again, it's a, a very much what happened in early Christianity. They had, they had these gospels, they had a, other sorts of teachings, and they tried to fit it together with this Trinitarian doctrine. And they had to do a lot of uh, twisting and, and uh, um, forcing and, and um, reshaping to try and get it into some sort of uh, consistent uh, set of dogmas. And you, you do see similar things um, in the... Uh, Neoplatonists, because they they took Plato's writings as essentially sacred scripture, and um, of course they had all of the uh, uh, other Greek literature, much of which was considered in, inspired, and and then their own experiences and the Chaldean oracles, which were, which they also considered essentially sacred scripture, you know, and so they had to try and fit all of this stuff together into a system, and in a sense, uh, Plethon took insights from that, but then, then kind of started over from scratch in another sense. So he has, oh, I don't want to go on it too long here, because again, you know, I could go on forever. But, you know, he's got Zeus as, as the supreme god. That's not too surprising. Then he's got uh, what he calls the super celestial gods. These are gods that are outside of space and time. They're literally eternal. And um, they're involved or their responsibility is to create things that are in space and time. Um, and there's two ranks of these super celestials, which he calls Olympians and Titans. And um, Olympians are essentially responsible for creating things that are immaterial. So they create souls of various sorts, among other things. And um, in particular, they create um, the souls of the celestial gods, which are in a lower rank, uh, and the souls of diamonds, which occupy the earth, and the souls of human beings, uh, all of which are considered immortal. 
Um, the lower rank of super celestials, the Titans, they're responsible for creating perishable things. Uh, so things that are embodied uh, and um, come to be and pass away, as we might say. So um, stuff in the, in the physical world, uh, whether it's living things or mountains, you know, that crumble away and so forth, things that come to be and pass away. Um, so those are super celestial gods. They're outside of space and time. They have no bodies. You know, it doesn't even really make sense to talk about a body. So they create the celestial gods. The celestial gods are the ones that are in the heavens. And um, there's um, um, basically there's the seven planets, the seven traditional planets and the stars, uh, the so-called fixed stars. Uh, and these he calls visible gods because you can look at them, you can see them. They're gods you can see. So they're not eternal. They are in time and space because you can see them. You, they move, right? But um, uh, now, uh, Plethon is pre Copernican. So he had a Ptolemaic or a geocentric view of the universe. And he said, you know, that based on common understanding, that the the stars are are uh, are never or ever everlasting. They're not eternal. They're everlasting. They're in time, but never will cease to exist. And uh, the planets also, and that um, they are uh, their motion is eternal. So you know the the stars go in a circle around the Earth, and the planets follow their their more complicated um, uh, trajectories around the Earth. Uh, again, geocentric. But um, these are gods that have bodies. They have ethereal bodies, which are fiery kinds of bodies, uh, but they're nevertheless physical in that sense. Uh, uh, so their their souls have these, these ethereal bodies. And so do diamonds. They have ethereal bodies, and so do we. Our ethereal body is kind of what glues together our soul and our physical body. And um, so the um, 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 uh, Titans basically are responsible for creating these ethereal bodies that, that we all have. So in that sense, you know, the uh, celestial beings, we, we've got several ranks of beings. Starting from us, we've got diamonds, which are here on Earth with us and have kind of airy uh, ethereal bodies. Then we have up in the heavens, um, so more remote, we have this, the planets and the stars with uh, their um, uh, fiery ethereal bodies. Uh, then we have outside of space and time, we have the super celestial gods. So that includes uh, the lower rank of Titans and the higher rank of Olympians and uh, Zeus who emanates this whole, whole business. Um, so, and we can communicate with any of those, but they're different kinds of beings. So we kind of communicate with them in different ways and we expect different things from them. Um, the celestial gods are very much involved with our life here on earth and our souls. So they're kind of governing what takes place uh, here on earth. And that's, you know, pretty much the standard uh, ancient astrological view. You know that the that the that the uh, that the um, the the celestial gods are governing the sublunary world, the world beneath the moon. In other words, the world here uh, on Earth. And um, we don't know exactly what functions Plethon attached to the different planets um, because those chapters were burned of his book. There's a lot we don't know especially a lot of the detailed stuff because it was burned. Um, so we suppose that the planets govern the sorts of things that they do in, in um, basically Renaissance and pre-Renaissance uh, Hellenic um, um, astrology. Um, the stars, because they don't move or they all move together, They're, they have a fixed relationship to each other um, he does say that their job is basically what they spend their life doing, life, so to speak, is contemplating the higher forms, the higher gods. So 
I think, you know, we can view, I like to view the, um, um, because what do these things mean to us now? Okay, so this is all based on a geocentric view of the universe. Well, that's wrong. <laughs> okay, the earth goes around the sun, you know, the stars are a long way away. There are big uh, balls of, 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 of uh, nuclear fusion like our sun and, and um, you know, so forth. Um, so we have a different view of the universe. So I think we have to understand these celestial gods symbolically. What do they symbolize to us? Because that's what their effect is on our souls. And I like to think of the, the fixed stars as being essentially corresponding to the archetypes of the collective unconscious. These are the things, they symbolize these ideas that are part of human nature and they're here essentially forever, you know, or at least as long as humans have been around. And uh, the planets then with their various relative motions, uh, kind of like described in astrology, reflect um, more active uh, archetypal processes within our individual uh, psyches. And um, so I think when we're contacting through theurgy, for example, planetary deities, uh, the celestial gods, um, I think what we're really dealing with is um, essentially diamonds that are more universal, but also more directly involved in our soul and the way our soul functions. And, and of course, that's a very useful thing to do. These are our helpers. Uh, these are our critics, you know, um, these uh, um, are very important to us. And so in that sense, I think these, the uh, planetary gods especially are uh, very important in human life. Uh, the others are much more remote, you know, and um, um, they're in those higher spheres or for the super celestial gods beyond the spheres. You know, if we think the, the ancients normally thought of the fixed stars as being the outermost sphere. Mm -hmm. That's the heavens. Yes. Super celestial is literally beyond that, but beyond not just outside, but out, outside of space altogether. So I think we expect different things from those very high gods than from the much more familiar gods, you know, that we find the diamonds here on earth and the celestial gods. Um, and I think, you know, all of these different sorts of things that we see in the Gnostics and uh, the Hermetic texts and, and many of these other traditions, you know, are really just putting different names, you know, and a different kind of structure to try and understand what's basically the same, the same kind of um, um, reality, really, I would say. Oh, yeah, I've gone on too long. <laughs> No, no, you, all, all great stuff. And again, I'm going to invite you, uh, if you're game, to discuss this for an hour plus on another show. Um, I, I I resonate with a lot of what you're saying. And uh, a lot of times in reviewing cult literature, like what colors are assigned to what days and things like that, once you figure out what their concept of the universe and the planets were, a lot of the symbolism all of a sudden makes uh, sense because we've always projected these things, you know, onto the, the sky and the, the planetary uh, and other celestial uh, bodies. Um, so I, I definitely want to explore that. And I, I look also to popular culture to see what's percolating in our collective psyches. And what's interesting is that the Empyrean has been making an appearance in popular culture a lot in comic books. Uh, then now it's in the Marvel movie, Thor, Love and Thunder. They had the place where all the gods live that's kind of like a little bit apart. Uh, and uh, it, it popped up, I heard, in Shazam, uh, the latest, I haven't seen it yet, but I heard it popped up there too. So uh, that's a pretty high concept, you know, and it's uh, the basis for a lot of neo-theosophical thought. Uh, mm -hmm. that there's like Deva Loka, you know, where the gods live, and uh, in a lot of the uh, um, astral projection uh, experiments that they did, there was like a god plane where all the different pantheons lived with their gods. So I find it interesting that it's percolating now in our popular imagination. So yeah. uh, uh, that's something I'll throw into that discussion when we have it. Does yeah, anybody have any questions to ask Apollonius? Um, I've got one weird sort of question to ask. Um, Apollonius, 
while you were talking, you mentioned Eric von Daniken and oh, Eric yes. von Daniken popularized the idea of ancient astronauts and and the possibility of, of the of ancient people seeing seeing these astronauts as their gods. Like, is that something that you would believe in or um, or, or would you just see that they're looking at totally spiritual phenomena? And they're just explaining it as best as they can using the resources they have around them. So ancient peoples tended to be limited to visions of chariots and horses and the like, whereas you know, we can conceive of um, UFOs and the like. I'm just curious as to as to where you stand on the issue. Yeah, I, I don't think um, I, I mean, I don't think I don't attach much uh, credence to his theories. Um, and in, in fact, I think it's kind of, um, it's, it's an over-materialization, I guess I would say. It's like he can't quite believe that people really believed in all of these gods, you know, and so forth. And so he figured there must be some sort of material uh, explanation behind it. And so he said, well, you know, what is it? Well, you know, some sort of... Um, um, uh, uh, spaceship or aliens, um, you know, or, you know, worlds in the collision to, to use another, uh, um, idea along those lines. So I think it's, it's kind of the opposite. It's, um, um, you know, Jung was saying we have these general, these, these genuine spiritual experiences and we tend to um, interpret them in um, a way that's comprehensible to us. To ancient people, they were okay with gods appearing and flying through the sky and, and stuff like that. Um, we're not so okay with that. So we, we, we're we not so comfortable with gods arriving in chariots, but we are comfortable with alien beings arriving in flying saucers. You know, that seems a much more plausible thing. And I think that's kind of the same thing that von Daniken did, is he basically said, well, you know, uh, I can't believe that, you know, people actually believed all of this stuff about God. So they must have been, it must have been some technological thing that they were, you know, just misinterpreting. Well, I think it's, he's got the misinterpretation backwards. He's interpreting spiritual things technologically, you know, and I think that's, you know, the, essentially the mistake he's making. Um, so, you know, if, as long as you understand that that's an interpretation, I think it's, you know, it's fine. I mean, you know, if, if you, if you, if, uh, cause gods are aliens, right? Mm. <laughs> it's just, they're not coming from a different planet. They're coming, you know, from, from something outside the universe altogether. So, um, <laughs> again, as long as you don't over literalize it, you know, and start looking for, you know, a spaceship buried in the desert somewhere or something like that. Um, or, you know, maybe alien DNA or something. I, you know, I'd say that's the mistake is when you start say, taking it too literally and, and not saying, well, this is, this is a modern version of the story. You know, Star Trek was another modern version of the story. And um, um, so as long as you understand, well, this is a story, we're telling it in terms that are, are maybe more familiar and more comfortable for people now, but it's just a story of something deeper behind it you know we talk about the ineffable one you know and and um, um, mystics talk about how you can't put these things in words so we create these metaphors and analogies and uh, stories to tell about it indirectly and um, that's what they were doing in ancient world and we can do it now too as long as i i think we need to be clear that that's what we're doing you know um and not over literalize it. I think over literalization is the cause of many of the world's problems, certainly amongst religions. Um, but um, um, yeah, and those are phenomenally wise words, you know, because yeah. these are stories, and it's our choice to live them, and it's our choice to retell them, you know, in a way that's most meaningful uh, for us. And uh, once you realize that. Um, a lot is lifted because then you no longer have to find something that you're lacking. You realize that what you're looking for is already in you and that you can create something with it. And thank you. Absolutely.
And last but certainly not least, our muse, Brandy Williams. <laughs> and um, I, I want to say this is such a fascinating conversation. And I'm, I'm so appreciative, Hercules, that you bring sort of these different communities together. So we're, we're talking about the UFO communities. Tony's talking about the Starseed community. And then we talk about what we do with theurgy. And it, it really, it, it's almost like a, a cross-cultural conversation and i really love the openness of this group that we're able to to do these mappings and and say yep you know maybe this is the way we're telling this story now so really i really appreciate that and as um tony as you were talking about the pleiades i was thinking about um my my tantric group which connects the pleiades with a set of um, hindu deities and i wanted to to mention a book the seven sisters of the pleiades by munya andrews and you know this book, yeah. Wait, uh, she really just goes into like the the um, Pleiades and um, sort of cross cultural understandings of of the the stars and and uh, the the seven seven sisters and it, it's mostly seven sisters around the world, but also um, it is um, the the there's there's a few seven brothers, you know, and then <clears throat> there's more than one, you know, there's a there's one that we've lost sort of faintly. There might be more than seven. So it's a, it's just an interesting if you're interested in the Pleiades. It's, it's an interesting place to go. Well, thanks then, for the tip. Yeah, um, I was thinking too about um, to cross cross culturally the idea that we come from the stars. And uh, Hercules knows that I've been researching a book a, about the star goddess. But there are so many different ways that we look at the star goddess over cultures. But this this idea that we come from the stars is like built into our culture. The the Kemetic people, the Egyptian people, talked about the souls um, returning to the stars, going going back to the stars. And this is the exact Neoplatonic thought that our source, souls originate in the stars and then manifest here. And um, I, I think that I found that that really meaningful. And, and it, so it's very interesting that it continues to come back in these this sort of different cultural ways. And I also was thinking about um, Parmenides uh, in, in doing the the Star Goddess book. I, I was focused. You, you wanted um, Olympians. So Aphrodite, Aphrodite Urania, you know, the, the celestial Aphrodite. Um, Parmenides wrote a, a poem on nature, which was a um, it's a theurgic, really thought it, he he talks about a vision he had where um the the daughters of the sun the heliades came and put him in a chariot and drove him um to the to the celestial place where he met thea goddess and then peter kingsley goes on about her in a very poetic way i, I can only read kingsley like like this because i start writing about him like him because <laughs> he has this really like storytelling voice that's lovely you know so he, he wrote um the book reality and uh, in the dark places of wisdom where he talks about who thea might be so there there are scholastic ideas about who parmenides might have been talking about and one of them is persephone but he, he also he throws in um aphrodite urania in the in the um ring is it maybe goddess is Aphrodite, the, the great goddess of love. And so I, I, re I relate to the, I sort of resonate with the idea of the, the star goddess of love. Um, my, my awakening on my spiritual journey past, past the Catholicism of my, my youth was reading the, the first book on witchcraft I read had a version of the charge of the goddess where the star goddess speaks. She says, you know, there's there's a narrative voice hear ye the words of the star goddess she in the dust of whose feet are the hosts of heaven whose body encircles the universe and then the star goddess speaks directly she says i who am the beauty of the green earth and the white moon amongst the stars and the mystery of the waters and the desire of the human heart call unto thy soul arise and come unto me and that's that's just you know the the most stirring thing imaginable of course later as we study the poem we discover that these words are cribbed from the book of the law <laughs> and the, the the voice is the voice of nuit the star goddess um who is never named in the poem <laughs> it's one of those things and nuit links back to the star goddess newt the the comedic star goddess newt so I, I understand um, it, it's one way of looking at the universe, right? That the universe is um, the goddess of love. <laughs> and I, I'm really in love with the idea that the universe is the goddess of love and that we all issue from her. Um, also, we were talking about where where we locate the gods. I think as a, as a witch and as a golden dawn magician and as a thelemite and as a theurgist, I locate, and, and as a tantric especially, I locate the gods in us. We are the living representatives of the gods, Hercules, you know? <laughs> um, so it's an interesting, it's an interesting thought how um, 
so we exteriorize the gods, you know, okay, the, there's this idea that they're out there somewhere or they're different from us. And then there are the traditions where, well, we are contiguous with the gods, where we're connected to them. We are, our being is the same as the being of the gods. We are all made of star stuff, right? And that's true on the physical level and true on the spiritual level. So the, the, that's kind of, that's where I went. One of my responses is uh, Apollonius was talking about the, the bodies of the gods. The bo we are the bodies of the gods. Mm -hmm. That's all I've got. Okay, that's a lot. Thank you. Wow, I'm looking forward to your book when it's written. And you know, we have to Thank devote uh, shows uh, to it and uh, continue this conversation then on a much uh, grander uh, scale. I believe also, and I've, I've stated it uh, a lot of times, that we're the gods. And just like in dreams, it's us, you know, we're sometimes we're who we are in waking life. Sometimes we're not, we're someone else. Sometimes we're doing the same thing. Sometimes we have different lives altogether, but it's still us and we don't question the life we're living. Um, I've spent a lot of my life doing uh, um, meditations and astral projections and all these uh, mind things. And the waking world seems like a little better than a, a dream. And it feels just as uh, tenuous. And uh, if you go, especially in the hypnagogic and the hypnopompic states, it looks altogether fuzzy, like an old TV or, uh, you know, a very bad digital uh, uh, image with pixelation and, and things like that. Uh, so I believe that somehow we're the dream of the gods. And uh, um, as I've shared before, too, that that isn't something you could take off on and start your own cult, because if you're one with the gods, so is everyone and everything else is one with the gods. And, you know, we seem to be governed by the same symbolic language that uh, happens in dream or symbolic languages. And some of them are very highly individual and mean something just us. And some of them can, you know, what we're experiencing can be very true of the culture uh, around us. And that's why I've always believed that every life is important because whether you're asleep, as some people call it, and you're just living out the programmed, uh, you know, dream um, you're still part of a di digestive process of a sort where you're digesting experience for the gods. And if you're more awoke, and now being woke is a bad thing, uh, I guess, in our culture, uh, then you can consciously make choices and use your imagination and your creativity to come up with options. Because I believe the gods are stuck in their stories. They've been stuck in their stories throughout our history, the stories still repeat, we still live their stories, we still, you know, uh, get enmeshed in their stories. So um, I, I believe we're here to wake up and to break the gods of their, their cycles that they're stuck in. So all of us are very important, not just certain individuals, you know, every single life serves that purpose, whether you're awake or asleep. And uh, we're all gods. We have a couple of more minutes. Uh, is anybody doing anything new or exciting in the weeks ahead? Yes. Um, I'm going to Babylon Rising. And so this is the last show before I actually go do that. So I'll be in person, you know, touch wood, <laughs> if all the travel arrangements go well, um, I'll be in person in, in uh, Bedford, Indiana, um, June 4, 5, no, um, 9, 10, 11. So I'm, uh, I'll be talking about some of these, these things there. We'll also be doing a Sisters of Sashat Earth Initiation and founding a temple. We have now two temples, Sisters of Sashat, so we're, we're making progress. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited about that. And e each time I go to Babylon Rising, it feels like um, the, the community is, is really um, saying, we, we like your work and we want to sponsor it. It feels like a sponsorship. And so I, I take the opportunity to like, do a new body of work. And I'm doing that here um, in, in, at Babylon Rising. So I'm very excited about that. Um, and I also wanted to mention, too, that I, I recently attended uh, uh, the kickoff for a new campaign it, with showing up for racial justice. We talked about uh, we talked about social justice work here and showing up for racial justice is now calling on people to come and join them to um, make connections with with white people, working class white people and listen to the concerns of white people as we move into the next election cycle so we can um, unite together against this sort of growing rise of authoritarianism. And uh, they, they made the point that if, if we succumb to authoritarianism, we can't uh, 
uh, continue the the racial justice work that we do, it becomes very, very difficult. So this is really a good time <laughs> to stand up. So I, I encourage people to go like look at the Surge website and connect with the things that you might might be um, interested in doing. And we might return to that conversation in our, our conversations here and like keep that in front of us as we move in, into the sort of the next um, phase. I think uh, we all we all stand for liberty. Yes, and if you could email me or PM me the information, I will look through it and I will continue to post uh, something about it. Great. Hey, Apollonius, anything new and exciting happening in your world? Um, well, yes, um, I've got, um, I'm gonna be also traveling here in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, I'm gonna be going to uh, Rome uh, and um, I'm hoping to actually to visit some of the Mithraic uh, caves in Rome awesome. while I'm there, you know, in addition to, you know, some of the other stuff, but, in, but that's one of the particular things on my list. And um, then I'll uh, be going down to uh, Catania in Sicily, uh, on the, right on the edge of Mount Etna, um, where Empedocles made his famous leap <laughs> to join Hecate. <laughs> um and um so uh that's um that's keeping me busy pl planning for all of that stuff right now um and um i i i don't know where i was in the process last time we met but my bilingual edition of of Plethon's, uh writings the laws and some of his other writings is now out um awesome. so you can read the greek and english uh in parallel if you like um and um, I'm actually, after many years, almost have a, a second edition of the Pythagorean Tarot ready. Uh, 700 pages with lots of color illustrations. So it, it won't be cheap, unfortunately, but um, it will be complete. <laughs> so so that's, I've, I've gone through the whole text, uh, proofreading it and updating it and stuff like that. I'll, I'll need to go through it at least one more time. Um, but um, it's getting pretty close. So um, um, I'm pretty excited about that. And th that is exciting for me to hear because on your on our very first conversation <laughs> that came up and you were talking about how you were hoping of someday uh, putting it out again. So I'm glad that that day fast approaches. <laughs> well, some of this other uh, book publishing stuff I've done has in some sense been just to get some experience with the process uh, on smaller things. Uh, and less complicated things. I should also mention in July, I'll be at Mystic South uh, talking about ancient Greek divination. So that's about all that's on my schedule right now. That, that's all. <laughs> that's a respectable amount of things, <laughs> more than respectable. It keeps me busy. <laughs> Thank you. And Tony, anything new and exciting with you? Um, nothing really new. Um, the only definite thing that I have is, is Witches Fest in New York City that's coming up. There are a couple of projects that are kind of up in the air, but nothing's actually crystallized yet. But um, hopefully at our next panel, I'll, I'll have some, um, some news to share. And I'll be at Ishtar Fest and uh, the same Witches uh, Fest USA that uh, you're at. And I will be speaking about uh, the uh, ancient Phoenician Hercules and the modern Theosophical Hercules. Uh, at, at all of those events in slightly different ways. Um, but that's been part of my process of digestion with all this information uh, that I've been getting. I want to thank everybody. You're awesome. And my life is very blessed by having you in it. And I'm, I look forward to these conversations always. I wish you all success with your ventures. Uh, and uh, I look forward to our next uh, conversation. <laughs>